Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. And as always, hit that subscribe button, everybody. We have an amazing show for you all because your boy of the mullet ship is Neil Clyde. He's the writer and creator of The Panic. Now come join me as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Clyde. Thank you so much for coming to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me today. Totally my pleasure, sir. So I always start off with questions of inspiration. So what inspired you to become a writer and who are your earliest influences? Uh, you know, I actually started off being an artist. Uh, I wanted to be a comic book artist uh, early on and spent a lot of time learning how to do that and assembled a bunch of samples, went to DC Comics with them and was told, you need a lot of work, uh, but your storytelling is pretty spot on. Like you, you're the anatomy's off, the pace, the layout, the cinematography, but your pacing, the storytelling is fantastic if you thought about becoming a writer. And so I really did a hard pivot around then and I taught myself how to write both prose and, and scripts. And I've just been sort of doing it every, ever since. Um, early influences for, as a writer, I would say uh, Will Eisner, you know, I'm Jewish and a lot of his work has really Same. kind of inspired me. Um, I would say I was very inspired by, by uh, the sort of the British invasion, Alan Moore, Grant Morrison, uh, Warren Ellis, um, all of the sort of the, the Mark Millar, Garth Ennis, right? That, you know, the sort of deconstructed superhero stories, um, really speaking in clip sentences, that really kind of inspired me. But over the years, you know, my, my influence has changed. I think right now I'm very influenced by television, right? A lot of the television that I watch, the stories that I, you know, that some fantastic uh, directors and screenwriters are telling, um, really helps kind of inspire the stories I want to tell. Um, but also my life, right? Like I started off writing comics when I was young and single living in New York. And now I'm living in the Jer Jersey suburbs with four kids, you know, with family, you know, wife and four kids. And uh, that really sort of changes the types of stories that I want to tell. So um, it really just, you know, life really influences you. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think I've um, reading your website, um, you mentioned that you pursued a career in graphic design. And then you say that this taught you that people could be persuaded by words and images, which obviously to me says comic books. <laughs> so has, how has that lesson from graphic design been transferred to the role of a combo, as a comic book writer? Uh, you know, so I have, I, yes, I have a day job. I'm a, I'm a UX designer, really. I started in graph, print graphics, and then I moved to digital media, designing apps and websites. And it's less about, uh, to me, it's about really trying to tell a story and also listening to other people's stories, right? So as a, as a designer, you want to, especially in, when you're in advertising or graphic design or print media, you're trying to sell somebody on something. You're trying to sell an idea based on the, the hybrid of, of text and imagery and using those to really kind of make your case or make someone laugh, make someone cry, make someone buy into whatever it is you're selling. Hmm. As a UX designer, as somebody who's designing products for people, I spent a lot of my time listening to people, listening to their stories, the things they want, the things they need. All of that really helps me as a storyteller. It helps me to learn how to listen to a story and how to tell a story. Because a lot of the times when you're a writer, you really absorb the world around you, right? You know, I'll be at the mall and I'll listen to the way people speak. Dialogue kind of comes, snippets of dialogue will come at me. I listen to my kids, I listen to everybody. I listen to my users, right? But at the end of the day, you want to also be able to tell a story in terms of solving somebody's need, right? So look, comics, the driving need is people want to be entertained, but people also mm -hmm. want to feel, right? You want to feel sad or happy or scared. And so as a writer, my job is to tell a story in a way that evokes those feelings out of you, good or bad. Mm -hmm. And so being able to sort of listen to the stories around me and then analyze them and figure out the stories that I want to tell and stories I want to read as, as a reader helps me kind of get stories out on the page. No, I really like that. And, and I think it's interesting because I think as also someone myself who's an indie comic book writer, is that a lot of people who get into the comic book business forget the business side of it. I mean, this is, as much as you are a great salesman, it's sales as well. Yeah. And having been experienced in sales, feels like that gives you a leg up in comic books. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not, there are people who are much savvier about it than me. I will go on record and say, a lot of the publishing and distribution aspects of creating comic books. Um, I wouldn't say bore me to tears, but like, I just don't, like, I just want to create a book. I want to put a book out and hopefully that book will sell, right? And I know all my publishers are grinding their teeth right now and saying like, what are you talking about? 
Um, it has not, obviously I want the book to sell and I want people, you know, the more you sell, the more you can make more and the more, you know, your company does well and the industry is stable. Um, but at the end of the day, my focus tends to be more on the creative aspect of it, right? Mm. The construction of the story, the, the craft, working and collaborating with co-authors, with editors, that is what really is exciting to me and telling the story and immersing myself in characters and motivations and themes and plot. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a product, right? You're selling a product and you want that product to do well and you position it in the best way you can, whether it's writing for the market or understanding like, look, I would love to create a 30 to 40 page epic tome here, but I probably am not going to get past epic issue three until I'm canceled, right? So you just have to kind of know that going in. And I would say years of trial and error have sort of shaped that. Um, one of the great things about what I'm able to do as a designer and as a writer is I have really touched all aspects of the craft of making a comic. So I've written comics, I've drawn comics, I've lettered and designed them, and I've also self-published them, right? So I've done the publishing and the distribution. And my opinion is if you're a creator getting into comics, you should at least at one time in your life touch every aspect of the process so that you can understand the constraints, but also sort of like where to push the envelope. Hmm. Um, and I think that that's a huge thing to, in, to know. And, and part of that is, you know, selling your comic. You, you wanna be in a position to market your comic at least once to understand the limitations of marketing, marketing a comic um, because it makes you a better creator at the end of the day. Mm. So um, you're also the writer creator of a new series, mini series called The Panic. Uh, what inspired the creation of The Panic? Uh, so a couple things. So I've been writing The Panic for a long time now. I actually was inspired to write it right after 9-11. Uh, I was living in the city in New York when the towers fell and was very inspired by New Yorkers really coming together to, to work together, to putting, putting aside all their differences, both cultural, societal, you know, what have you, racial, and basically just saying like, we're human beings, we're here to help one another, and we're going to do that. And I've been in other instances before where that's happened. I lived in Israel for a year and I've seen, you know, the aftermaths of bombings and people just kind of coming together to, to help people who need help. Um, but I've also seen the fear. I've also seen that moment of just like, oh shit, what, what, what just happened? Hmm. Whether you know it or not, whether it's a bombing in a, in a pizza restaurant and you're caught in the blast or whether you're, you know, 30 blocks uptown from the towers falling and you're like, wait, what's happening to my city right now? There's a moment of, un of unknown. And one of the things that really struck me was I heard a lot of stories about people who were trapped in the subway when the towers fell and didn't really know what was going on. We're getting things fed to them because the cell service was down. They couldn't get signals. And at that time, you really couldn't get a signal on the subway. Now you can. But um, there was a lot of that. I, there must have been a lot of this sense of like, what the fuck is happening? And that's kind of what I wanted to capture. I wanted to capture this sense of when you don't know what's happening, when the, you're in the dark and you're with a bunch of strangers, will the strangers come together to survive? And when I wrote it, like I said, it was, it was very of its time. It was more about terrorism. But over the last 20 years, as I've sort of evolved it, it started as a novel and then we evolved it into a comic book. And I worked with a few editors on it. Um, things have happened here in America, right? You know, uh, things have gotten more politically divisive, more racially, sexually. Uh, it's just been really, really, really bad, to be honest. And my question when we, when Andrea and I did this, the, the instance of the panic that's now being put out through Comixology was, are we too divided as a nation to actually come together when the lights go out? Hmm. Like, is there just too much shit in the way right now? And especially since, you know, the 2016 election and since, you know, all the things that have been happening over the last year, especially, and the pandemic, you know, all of that really helped sort of shape and form the story a little bit more. And so we've arrived at a place much, much different than where I started. Mm. And my, look, I've drawn conclusions, myself and Andrea, you know, Moody, the, the artist on the book, my co-author on the book, uh, my, my partner, um, he and I have arrived at conclusions that you as a reader may not arrive at, right? They may be sort of my feelings as a writer. I, you know, I have that sort of creative liberty to, to do that. And there's this sense of just like, are you right, Neil? Or are you wrong, Neil? And I, I don't know. Like, I'm, I've not been in that situation, thank God. And I worry about ever being in that situation where, uh, for those who don't know, the book is about 
uh, a bunch of people who are on a PATH train from New Jersey to New York, and something happens more science gone wrong than terrorism. And they kind of have to figure out what's going on. They're trapped under the Hudson River and they have to get out. And that's really what the book is about. And so I've not been in that situation. So I, like, I don't know what would happen. I'm just sort of making guesses and looking at these characters and letting this, them tell the story. Um, and there are instances that have happened recently. You know, there was a, a shooting in Brooklyn uh, like a month, month and a half ago where thank God people stepped up, doctors, you know, everybody kind of jumped in to, to really minimize the damage. And my hope is that's how we should be as a people. We should come together. Mm. Our story, the panic, is the cautionary tale. It's what happens when that doesn't happen. Mm. What happens when people just are too far gone to really work together to get out? Mm. Uh, it's a very, very happy tale. <laughs> well, as you said, the artist is of the panic is um, Andrea Moody, you said, is how you pronounce the name. Uh, what does Andrea bring to the table and how did this part of shift first begin? Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I was familiar with his work through, he's been working with other friends of mine, Paul Tobin and, and some other folks. And um, he is a fantastic artist and he is painting the story. And what he did was two things. Number one, as, as a writer or as a co-author, you wanna find a partner, a brother in arms who is willing to basically call you on your bullshit. <laughs> basically say, you know, because look, that's, comics is a collaboration, right? There's, it's not me writing a story and saying, go do this. It's me writing a story, passing it over the wall and saying, what do you think? And him saying, well, we should really think about this. And us sort of pass, passing it back and forth. And there were moments where he was like, you have too many people in this panel, or, you know, we need to remove a panel or this isn't working. And like, that's true collaboration. And he and I really uh, synced really well early on. We were put together by Chip Mosher, who was uh, who uh, runs Comixology, Comixology Originals. Uh, he introduced the two of us and it's been a, a fantastic partnership. Um, one of the other things that I think he brings to the table, which is beautiful, is we talk about the ensemble, the characters in our story. And there, as we've been sort of talking about it over the last year, there are two unmentioned characters in the story. The first one is fear. Fear really drives this tale. And then the second one is color. Color really drives the tale as well. And when you get a chance to look at the, the artwork, you can really see how his use of, of color, vibrancy, uh, saturation, all that really helps drive a dr the, the drama of the story and also sort of the emotions of the story. Especially when you're talking about, you know, if this was in reality, this would all take place in the dark. And there's mm -hmm. that question of like, how do you tell a story that takes place underground with the lights go off? And he really uses reds and oranges and, and blues and neutrals to really heighten the drama or reduce the tension and really kind of drive things forward. And um, I think that is definitely something that I as a writer can't do and really appreciate him being kind of there to, to take, the, take the lead and, and make the story sing. So as, as you said, the panic is being released by Comicsology Originals. Correct. Um, why was that the perfect way to release the book? And also um, will there be a physical version of the book at some point? Yeah, so Comixology is great. I've been I've been um, talking to Chip over there for a while now, and I've been loving the original story they do. You know, we were just having a conversation on social media about the loss of Vertigo Comics, right? So Vertigo mm -hmm. Comics was really the place that you went and you looked at comics that were really um, more creator driven and really kind of whether they were supernatural, the real life, or what have you. They 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 were genre stories that really kind of drove a certain tone and a certain feel. And with the loss of them you kind of see these kinds of stories being told across multiple publishers. You know, you have your vault, you have your aftershock, you have your ahoy. Um, Comixology has been doing a fantastic job curating a list of titles that really tell a variety of stories that, you know, in the vein of, of the old school Vertigo title library, really kind of cover a span of storytelling with some great creators, right? You've got Scott Snyder, Chip Starsky, mm. um, Alex Segura, a bunch of people. And I've always really wanted to publish with them. Um, also because I've always been interested in publishing something that's kind of a physical digital hybrid to kind of hit um, readers who can't go out to the store, perhaps. Um, and so Comixology does this great thing with their guided view. They kind of walk you through the story um, on your phones, but then, um, they've got this fantastic partnership with Dark Horse Comics now, with whom I worked before, to really publish the more traditional print-based mm. versions of the story. So 
I love what they do from a digital point of view. I love their partnerships. I love the people over there. Um, and while it's not like, look, you have more traditional digital storytelling with a place like Webtoon, which does more kind of vertical scroll where you're using your mobile device or tablet device to kind of walk through a story. Um, Comixology draws your eye from panel to panel and does it in a really great way. Um, and for me, that was really compelling. Um, and hopefully I'll be doing more with them at some point. But yes, to answer your question, uh, the Panic is coming out. Uh, it's five issues, comes out monthly through Comixolo the Comixology app. Issue two just came out last week. Issue three comes out in July. And then we're going to collect it uh, with Dark Horse in the fall. And I, I, I will say that the plan is November, but with the supply chain issues going on, I don't know if that's going to slip. But for now, I'll say the fall. Mm. Yeah. Uh, now, the one cool thing about the comic book um, is that there are a lot of references to our current situation. I mean, you mentioned COVID. Um, one of the characters has the uh, MAGA hat uh, on, on his head. Um, so why is it important for the story to be set now? And how does our current atmosphere help to inform or enhance the story? Why is it important to tell it and set, set it now? Um, I'm very much into, I really wanted to tell a contemporary tale. And I wanted to tell a tale about New York as it, we are now. And when you tell a story about New York, right, you can do a period piece, right? Which, you know, is pretty easy. And originally, as I mentioned, this story was set 20 years ago. But as we kind of moved along and I was asking questions about political, cultural, and sexual divisiveness, I really felt like I needed to be up to the minute. We needed to be like, we need to set it now. So much of our, so much of our divisiveness has been driven by the political landscape and the pandemic of you know, the last couple of years. Um, and for me, that was really kind of an opportunity to explore how far gone is far gone. And that's really kind of why I wanted to uh, take a chance with that. What was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. So how does our current atmosphere inform and enhance the story? Um, and the way our current atmosphere, I think, enhances the story is, I mean, we're all kind of living in a bit of a panic at the moment. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I've noticed, especially if you're on social media, obviously, because social media sort of drives that kind of thing, mm. is that there's just this unknown of like how, what's going to happen, what's going to happen as we, you know, move to the next election, what's going to happen in terms of, you know, is the pandemic ever going to truly go away? Like, are we always going to be, is, is it going to be sort of, you know, my wife works at a nursing home and there's just surges, right? Mm. So like it goes away and then it comes back and then it goes away and it comes back. And even worse, you're seeing a lot of legislation, legisl legislation, not legislation, legislation happening. You can edit that. Um, you're seeing a lot of legislation happening that, to be frank, is harming a lot of people. You know, um, in Florida, in Texas, uh, gun control is sorely needed. Um, there's just a lot of bad shit happening, and a lot of people are frightened. And I have children. I have kids who. You know, sometimes I want to talk to them about it. Sometimes I don't. Um, and a lot of that anxiety, that fright really drives what I, the stories that I'm telling, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you talk about a story that's driven by fear, how can I leave out things that are on my mind? Um, but on the other hand, I definitely have a specific point of view, right? I'm a left-leaning Jewish liberal from the New York, New Jersey area. That is a specific point of view. Um, and there are people like our friend Rocco in the MAGA hat in our book who are not that, you know, don't have that point of view. And what I wanted to ensure when you look at sort of a slice of life within a subway car is that you really hit as many of the diverse voices as you can. And not, I'm not trying to pack it because like, oh, I need one of everything. But like, this is really what you'd find in New York. You'd find somebody who's conservative. You'd find somebody who's, you know, who's, who's, who's like me. Um, people of all different uh, political and sexual backgrounds and racial backgrounds. And, and that to me was important when you're telling a, especially a story about New York to make it as authentic as possible mm -hmm. and to treat it as sensitively as I can, but also understand that like, I am kind of bringing my point of view to the stage here. And sometimes people won't love that. Sometimes they will. And I can't control that. I can only tell the story that I'm able to tell. Right. Well, like I said, uh, respect from one um, liberal Jew in the in the Northeast <laughs> to another. <laughs> so definitely respect. Um, so one, 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 as you had mentioned kind of earlier, is that the story takes place in the midst of, of a crisis. Um, in, in many ways, it starts 
the story literally takes place in right in the immediacy of it. Um, is it important at, at any point to know what this actually causes any of this? Will that be discussed? Or will that, if that's just almost, it's almost like The Walking Dead where it doesn't really matter how the zombie plague started, just kind of did. It's the same thing that this doesn't really matter what caused this, that it just did. Yeah, so it's funny because when people ask me, I sometimes in a glib sort of way say, oh, we're The Walking Dead without the zombies. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the thing that I love about The Walking Dead. And I do love The Walking Dead. You know, the story that Robert and Charlie and, and Tony have told over the, you know, the last, what, several decades. Um, I don't know, since the 50s. Um, <laughs> it, it's not about the zombies, right? It's about us. It's about humanity. And that is really how we connect as readers to that story. Um, yeah, obviously the zombies are great and the tension is fantastic and all the, you know, the twists and turns and political maneuvering, but it's really about humanity and how does humanity survive when shit goes bad? Mm. And yes, at some point, uh, assuming the numbers are good and we can do more of the story, you know, you will find out what happened. Uh, there is uh, a very intricate backstory to the panic. The science is not just sort of thrown out there. And you see it in issue one, there's like a page where you can kind of see somebody flipping a switch. Um, and that switch, there's there's logic behind it. There's science there. Mm. Um, and the idea that I always wanted to do with the panic is really look at it as kind of like a, a closed box that you kind of have to, the original story, the title of the story was Coffin. And issue one is actually titled Coffin. And the idea was that you start in a coffin and you work your way sort of out to the graveyard and then out to the real, you know, the rest of the world. Mm. And that's, if you look at the titles of the issues, uh, it starts with coffin. And I think the next one is grave. And then issue three is tomb and then all the way out. And the idea was for the first five issues is you're just getting out to the graveyard. And then volume two, if we can get to it is the graveyard, right? Like getting out of the graveyard. And then, Volume three is out of the graveyard into the real world. And we're, we're looking at maybe three or four volumes in total. Um, but there's a story. There's a, a reason why what happened to the survivors happened. And they will find out uh, as the reader finds out. Um, but we may never get there. You know, sales and pre-orders really are kind of key to letting Andrea and I complete our story. Mm. Um, and we may just end at issue five with, all right, we're in the graveyard now and we're done. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping that that's not the case because there's a lot of cool stuff that I want to explore in Manhattan and in New Jersey. Uh, there's a lot of twists and turns that we'd love to get to in character development and, and other characters that we haven't seen yet that we'll kind of get drawn. And look, we're only on issue two. So there's three issues I'm trying not to spoil. Um, but um, yes, there's more. There's a story. Uh, look, The Walking Dead is done now. We I don't remember if we ever found out why there were zombies or like mm. what happened. I think it was just about surviving. Um, this story does do that. There is a point probably in volume three where our surviving commuters, whoever they may be, uh, will find out why their train crashed. And then there's really like the aftermath of like, once I, you know, the first two, first two volumes are about the unknown and the third volume is the unknown moving to the known. And the question is, what happens when the unknown becomes known? What happens to humanity, right? So like after 9-11, you know, once we knew kind of what was happening and, you know, some, some of the ideas behind it, then, you know, things change, right? Like the world changed, people's attitudes towards the Middle East changed and, 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 and also to like safety and security, right? So the world will change after our commuters and our readers understand why this happened um, but we have to get there and please pre-order and buy the book so we can do that so um i guess for, from a pers uh, pessimist perspective potentially if the story were to only go those five issues would those five issues um encapsulate a complete story i think so i mean it definitely leaves it open there's a point where at the end where something is left open um but I think for the story of getting out of the train and surviving these five issues, I think you definitely have a complete story. Um, I'm also not the kind of reader that thinks that everything has to be wrapped up in a pretty bow by the end. I famously did a grab, well, not famously, because 
I'm not famous, but uh, famously in my family, at least. Um, <laughs> I did a graphic novel uh, back in 2009 called The Big Con, which was about crises of faith and, and, and Judaism. And I left it on a cliffhanger, right? Like I left it sort of like, you don't really find out what happens to people. You just kind of leave it on. Like the big moral dilemma gets kind of wrapped up mm. and then you're done. And a lot of people were like, I can't believe you left it there. And I'm like, that's the story I wanted to tell, right? So I will say that for the first five issues, um, it, it wraps up to me, right? Like you look at Star Wars, like the episode, you know, for A New Hope. Um, they didn't know that they were going to do sequels, I guess, but like it wraps up at a certain place. And yeah, you know, Darth Vader is spinning off into space and he doesn't die. So like you could bring him back, but they could have also just left it there. And you could have had one movie with a really cool story that follows the hero's journey and been done and walked away. And that's kind of how I approach this. Like I can leave it at issue five and readers should be happy. Um, they will never find out what happened or kind of what happens after. And that's mm. fine by me. Um, but yeah, I'd love to tell the story. I'd love to tell the full tale. Um, but again, that, you know, you asked me originally about sales and marketing and that's an aspect of it. If, if it doesn't sell, comics, she's not going to put the bill for another one. <laughs> so most horror stories, um, you know, movies, uh, books, whatever, um, when you have, let's say, it's almost like a slash film or anything like that, where you have a host of characters and, that, and as the story goes on, certain characters that live, some characters die, obviously, that's how they go. There's, all, there's sometimes a moral part of that where the selection of who lives and who dies is based on a, a moral standpoint of the writer, director, whatever. Is there a concern, danger, or is there a consideration in this story where who you choose to live and die has potentially moral implications of who you're judging as being worthy of life and worthy of death? <laughs> so that's a tough one to answer because I don't want to spoil who dies. <laughs> um, people will die. Um, I will say that there was definitely small part of me that said I want to be careful about who those people are but I also wanted the story to tell itself I didn't want to take away from the fact that the narrative really needs to drive some of those decisions um I will say that there are one or two people that die because not just from a narrative point of view I needed to kind of have them die but also from a there was a point I was trying to make and I, I can't really kind of elaborate because I don't want to spoil the story. Um, but when you get to the last issue and bodies are on the table or on the floor or whatever, I, there's a point, there's some of them died for a reason and some of them didn't. Mm -hmm. Some of them died because death just comes, right? Uh, I would say in issue one, uh, we have a death and you know the book's out. We have two deaths in issue number one, uh, just based on the crash. One is Niadi, who is um, who's Annie's friend. And um, part of me is sad that she died, um, but I think it, she had to die a little bit to, to get Annie sort of emotional and moving. Hmm. Um, and um, I would have liked to have seen more of her. She was a great character. Um, but also David's parents die in the first issue. And that really kind of drives some of the story and the narrative around David. And about like him being kind of not just alone as a stranger, but alone as a child with a bunch of strangers and having been told like, they don't talk to strangers, especially in New York. Like, what does that, what does that do to him? Um, and both those deaths really actually push them together, which for me was really important to have them kind of both having been the characters that had people who they loved die on the train um, really kind of drives them to this, like, hey, I'm a survivor, you're a survivor, I'll look out for you if you look out for me. And so that was really narrative driven. Um, it wasn't like, I have to have this person die because they're just extra or because <laughs> they're a certain race or religion or political background. Um, I will say that some of those decisions did inform the rest of the cast as we move forward, but it was usually about narrative. It was usually about like, who do I need to tell this story and who do I need to die to tell, to kind of drive certain points in the story. Mm. So um, issue one, it seems very much from the perspective of Annie. Issue two seems to be very much from the perspective of 
Tim DeMarca, is that tonight, right? So will each issue f uh, follow a perspective of one particular character or is that just how the first two are set up? First two, um, I, I would say that if we get to kind of move forward, uh, um, some of the characters who have points of view really kind of drive the narrative. Um, I really just kind of wanted uh, some point of view characters in there that we can kind of relate to uh, both from terms of innocence kind of getting caught in it, but also somebody who's got the sense of responsibility like Tim. Tim has this sense of responsibility in that he was the driver. He works for the train, right? He works for the path system. And without anybody else of authority, it kind of falls to him. Mm -hmm. uh, really, there's this, you'll see as we go through the five issues, this question about like, what does it mean to be the leader? What does it mean to kind of like, who do I follow here? Um, and you can see for those who read issue two, the end of issue two kind of brings in a new character that really sets some of that on end, right? Mm -hmm. We bring in um, this cop at the end, uh, Lincoln McNeil, who is going to be around for the rest of the series. And uh, there's this moment of just like, well, what happens when a cop shows up, right? Like now some of us look to cops as like, oh, you know, uh, friendly neighborhood policeman, the guy who's got all the authority. And then some of us look at policemen as like, dangerous people people you know there are people out there who are not fans of the police and a lot of that really kind of comes into play when you talk about leadership like why why should i follow you or are you going to put me under your knee or mm. why should i follow you because you know uh, you beat up some of my fr cops beat up my friends right um but there's also this sense of like you got david again who's who's you know a 10 year old boy who's been told all of his life the police are your friends right as my children have been told, right? Like if you're lost or scared or need help, call the cops. And so uh, I know that for me, that's, or for my community, that's what you would hear because I'm privileged enough to be middle-class white. But there are uh, lots of communities where you don't call the police. Like those are not the people that you would mm -hmm. be reaching out if you were scared or in trouble. You would reach out to somebody in the community. And I think those questions are really interesting as we sort of drive forward, like who can I trust in order to get out of this? And how can I put aside my prejudices and the stereotypes that I know? And not just that, but how can I put aside shit that I've seen as a human being? Like, how can I put all of that aside to really trust another human? Mm. And so that's really what the book is about. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of good characters. There's, um, I'm probably getting the name wrong, Mr. Polacek. Mm -hmm. There's a Polachek and there's obviously Rocco, who we mentioned earlier, he's, he's the, the MAGA hat guy. Uh, and there's an interesting inter, um, interchange between the two characters about Rocco's hat and Mr. Polachek makes a reference to hats and hoods and things of that nature that have been used in history for different reasons, fear and things of that nature. Now, is, is this also like said, part of the message as well, the themes of these interactions? Is someone like Rocco capable of learning that empathy when speaking to one of his fellow train mates we'll find out right so <laughs> right so like one of the one of the cool things that I, and i don't again i don't want to spoil the rest of the series but one of the cool things that i think we get to do is when we talk about who lives who dies whose point of view is the right point of view is this book is or at least one of the things we tried to do with this book was really say don't judge a book by its cover right hmm. um there are characters who you kind of come in with a first impression because we're all strangers, right? You meet somebody on a train, you immediately form an impression about that person based on the way they look, the way they yeah. act, the things they say, the things they the things they wear, right? You know, Rocco was great, uh, was great to throw in the mix because I'll be honest, I've been on the street and I've seen that red hat and I immediately get this like tension, right? There's this moment of just like, ah. Yes. Um, and that's just me. There are people uh, in other communities who don't feel that way, who actually see it and feel like, hey, good for you, man. You know, like, I'm not that person. I know friends of mine who are. I know mm. people I know, especially in the Jewish community, who are very right-leaning Republicans who buy into that. And so really kind of when you see something like that, um, it really kind of informs an opinion. You know, I, I laugh uh, to make the comparison, but it's like, it's like seeing a, a Red Sox hat on the South New York subway or, you know, seeing a Yankees hat walking around in Boston Common. There's that moment of just like, fuck you, man, right? Like that moment where you're just like, what are you doing? And that's a terrible comparison, right? Sports and politics should never be compared. But yeah. 
Um, my opinion is when I like I when I find out at a dinner table that somebody you know voted for Donald Trump or somebody supported a certain piece of legislation that I don't believe in, it definitely informs my opinion of that person. Mm. And what I want to do, or what Andrea and I wanted to do with this, as well as our editor, Mariah, wanted to do was really say, first impressions can be dangerous because you might be judging somebody as evil who's not and is there to help you. And you might be judging somebody who feels like a hero that is going to stab you in the back. Mm. And that is something that we really wanted to set up through many, with many of these characters. And hopefully as we kind of truck towards the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, in issue five, um, a lot of that will come to light. A lot of that will, will be, will be seen that like, you know, Rocco maybe contains hidden depth or somebody else in the book can, you know, is a, is a snake. So mm. I'm hoping people, the readers, the people who like the book are surprised and, you know, uh, appreciate what we're trying to do. Well, like I said, it was, I read the first issue. I got read part of the second issue. I really enjoyed it. I think you did a great job of creating these uh, different characters and making them each one sound genuine, which I think is fantastic. So for our listeners, where, when can they find the second issue? Uh, so the second issue is out now. It's out um, uh, in the Comixology app. I believe you buy it through the Amazon Kindle store or through Amazon, and then you can load it on your Comixology app. Um, the third issue comes out in July, and I don't have the date right off the top of my head. I want to say July 8th, but I think that's wrong. <laughs> so you can cut this, but the issue is, comes out. Ah, oh, crap. Sorry. If you give me a second, I'll tell no you. Worries. And you can edit this, right? Panic number three comes out on July 5th. Okay, very good. Panic will come out on July 5th, uh, right after Independence Day. Uh, and then the 4th in August, and uh, the final issue will come out in September. And the idea is that the full collection uh, comes out hopefully in November, but in the fall, depending on when it actually comes out. Uh, you can pre-order issues three, four, and five and the trade right now. You can buy issues one and two. Yeah. All right, that's perfect. Uh, Mr. Clyde, totally a pleasure um, speaking with you. And I hope our listeners pick up, uh, not pick up, download The Panic off of <laughs> Comixology. So thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for having me.